Welcome back. Hope you've all had a great day so far. Again, my name is Charlotte Kahn. I'm director of the Boston Indicators Project at the Boston Foundation, and welcome back to this afternoon session. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over some of the history about how we got to where we are right now. And um, I talked about it just a touch in an earlier session. So for those of you who were there, I apologize if it's going to be going over the same material. But um, in 1991, I was brought to the foundation, Boston Foundation, to run something called the Boston Persistent Poverty Project. And one of the things that um, that project was intended to do was to develop very local data-driven strategies to reduce poverty. It was a, an initiative of the Rockefeller Foundation. And one of the, many of the other cities, there were six cities, um, had begun to develop data capacities. And in Boston, we had not done that. We had spent quite a lot of money on a huge survey, which was very important, but it was a one-of kind of study, and it really wasn't building a, a data infrastructure. So. Um, you know, I thought that that was part of my job, and in, in 1992, I invited a lot of people from the Census Bureau and various public agencies in a big room. We all sat in a big circle, and I, it was occurring to me this was approximately exactly, or you know, within days, 20 years ago. Um, and we said, uh, would it make sense to try to create some sort of shared data capacity? And everybody said, yes, it would. I mean, that was the sense, sense of the meeting in, in the Quaker uh, world. And so we started to try to make that happen. And I don't know if he's still here. I hope he is. John Avalt from the VRA was one of the early members of that. We had a number of people from uh, public agencies in Boston, some from state agencies, sitting around talking about how are we going to make this happen. And immediately we hit the wall of uh, confidentiality and sharing data and you know bureaucratic turfdom and all of those kinds of things it took us a couple of years to get through the, that and to actually begin to have uh, public agencies agreeing to share their data and putting it into, it into something that we called uh, the Boston Children and Families Database and actually Holly I think started working on that when she was with the city of Boston in 1998 um, but in, in 1994, we actually had compiled quite a lot of data. And we had, we put it on those, remember those big floppy disks, some of you, um, the big kind of black ones? Um, and we had what we used to call, um, or was dubbed by one of our members, barefoot GIS. So we had a big, beautiful map of Boston, and you take a big piece of acetate and put it up on the map and draw with a, we, we handed these out grease pencil around where, where your neighborhood was that you were interested in looking at. And then you would take the piece of acetate and walk over to another big map and put it on top of a map of census tracts of the city of Boston to figure out what census tracts were in your area. And then you'd type them into this thing and it would pull up data uh, for those census tracts, barefoot GIS. So, um, you know, we did that, but a lot of the data that we had in our database was what people might refer to as deficit-oriented. In other words, a lot of public agencies are mandated to collect information about teen pregnancies, school dropouts, unemployment, all sorts of things that when you add them all up, no matter how a community is doing, it paints quite a, a dismal picture of that community. And people were starting to say, well, what about voting? What about arts? What about this? What about that? That we didn't have because people weren't collecting that, uh, those data. And at the same time, my colleague, um, Gita Pradhan, who unfortunately is not here today, um, was then running something in the, for the city of Boston called Sustainable Boston. And her boss had asked her to begin to put together a set of sustainability indicators for the city of Boston. They had started to do that, and I, she used to say, don't say this out loud, but I think enough years have gone by now to uh, acknowledge that they had found it extremely difficult to get 
city agencies together to share their data. So she knew that we had had this sort of outside thing going on, the Children and Families Database, and she said, let's try to you know, work together and create these indicators of sustainability together. So we, in early 97, um, we had the first meeting at the Boston Foundation, and we brought together people working on comprehensive uh, community building initiatives the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, Codman Square, uh, Neighborhood of Affordable Housing in East Boston, and others, because we knew that they were measurement challenged. They were doing really deep work, but they were having a hard time explaining to anybody what was really happening and why it made a difference. So, um, so we started to work on indicators. Over the next two or three years, we had hundreds of people developing an indicators framework we actually came out with our first indicators report, and at the same time, we started to work more closely with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and Holly had then moved there. Um, and there was also a project going on about new, sort of New England's future, and as part of that, they were gonna have an indicators project, and the University of Mass Lowell was part of that. And so, Holly and I had, had this vision for years of developing a set of nested indicators, nested data, so that we could sort of move up and down, you know, from the neighborhood level, even a point, a point data within a neighborhood, all the way up to, you know, the state level data, or even the nation, even, I don't even think we thought as big as global, but, um, but that was our vision, and um, somehow we, we got a little grant, right, from the, James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Foundation to start to try to put this together. And we knew that we wanted it to be open source. Although I have to say for myself, I'm not sure I really knew what that meant at the time, but I was convinced by Holly that it was really important. So um, we began to try to build this thing. We talked eventually to UMass Lowell, right? Or no, first we did our due diligence and we ended up with this um, you know, a proprietary company that was building something like what we wanted, even in open source, but just as we were about to sign the contract and spend that little money that we had gotten, their uh, venture capitalists pulled the plug and, and everything went to court. So we just barely missed being part of that. So we sort of started over. In any case, to make a long story short, eventually we started collaborating with the University of Massachusetts Lowell and with George Grinstein and his shop and Bill Mass from the uh, Center for Industrial Competitiveness to try to create this platform in open source with their students. And we then realized that it was gonna take a lot more money than we you know, had figured on and we realized that we needed to reach out to others and get a bigger kind of collaborative going in order to really build this thing. And so we reached out to other members of something called the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which includes groups like the Providence Plan, and which is represented here today by Jim Luft, to our, our uh, colleague in, in New Haven, Connecticut, Jim Farnham. And I guess we had told Jim about what we were trying to do, and every time I saw him, he said, well, so how's that coming? And it was never really coming. <laughs> but anyway, we started enlarging this group. And you see now on the screen in back of me a long list of partners. I believe there are now 15 groups, teams, working together around the country with 20 students at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, many of whom are here today, with George Grinstein and his shop uh, in computer science there. and. Um, and George has two to the students who've been very involved with this for three years now to his left, and they'll present on their own. But, um, you know, and others from Holly's staff who've been working so hard on this. I'm looking at Susan Brunton in particular, Christian Spanring here, right here. Um, we've all been building this thing together, and all of this is coming to a crescendo right this second, because for the first time, in a sense, in 20 years, we now have something to offer you all as a platform that really works. 
that you can use, you can get trained on, that will uh, has the capacity to put all of this shared data on it to really make sense of, you know, to the extent that data can make sense of anything, make sense of our world and help drive constructive change forward. So, you know, I feel very excited and very proud and pleased to be standing here today after all these years. <laughs> So congratulations to all of our partners. Thank you all for being here. This is very exciting. So while Susan's getting the demo up, um, I'm just going to be a little embarrassed because I was just going to talk about how we've been working for two years on this, and it was a big moment. I wasn't going to talk about 20 years of work. Wow, that's intense. Well, I, yes. Anyways, it's been a long road, but I think we will continue to evolve it even after our demo today. So Susan's going to take a minute to um, pull up the demo. i got to move the other side of you, Susan. Can you hear me? Um, can I have one of the wireless mics, please? I think they'll be here. Um, so while Susan and Barry are working on getting the site up, um, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you in a little bit more detail to our team. One of the best parts of my job is I work with a really great team of individuals in the data services department at the Metro Policy and County Council. Susan, who is busy pushing buttons right here, is a GIS analyst who specializes in geospatial databases that help make this happen. Christian Spanring, I'm going to ask you to stand up, please, in case the crowd. Um, is a GIS developer who really did a lot of the programming to make this website happen. Um, also, Jamila Henderson, who many of you talked to, who helped organize the conference, maybe is downstairs at the registration table. Um, she did a lot of the data work and crunched a lot of the numbers and helped with the data visualization. Also, um, to the remaining members of the data services team, Tim Reardon, who is the co-manager of the department, who is not here. Um, oh, there he is, sitting in the back. Um, as well as Magna Delta and Barry Prakin, who are our GIS now. It's really been a team effort, and I really want to thank them. And before them, I have to really say that it's important when people believe in your vision. And Mark Grayson, our executive director at NACC, and Joelle Barrera, our deputy director at the back, um, always believe in the vision that we have for democratizing data and making information available to our NACC constituents on the web and making it easy for them to use information and planning and policy work. And they always believed in us, so thank you. OK, great. Um, so this is the MetroBostonDataCon.org. You can go visit it now. It's up. It's running. Um, the old legacy website, we will keep around until June, for those of you who are diehards. Um, and you can find that at legacy.metrobostonstatacommon.org. Uh, um, so this website is a one-stop shop for data and information about our region. Um, it takes a comprehensive look at municipalities and across municipal and neighborhood boundaries. And when we created it, we took a number of things from our old website and carried it forward, and we thought of the, about new ways to do some things, basically based on the feedback from our users. One of the things that we really found our users liked and we thought worked really well was thinking about the different user levels we, we all represent, beginner, advanced, and sometimes intermediate, or in between. Uh, and so we had different tools that different people can use at different times. Sometimes I'm a beginner, because I just have no time. Someone's on the phone with a press request, or the mayor calls you into, your, into his office. Um, sometimes you just need information quick. And so one of the best ways to start the data common and access information in an easy way is through the regional map gallery. Um, this shows maps uh, that have been featured in our regional calendar and annual report that span a variety of topics that, you'll, that will look familiar to you, so from the Boston Indicators Project and the Regional Indicators Project. Um, they feature a map of a, a regional issue of significance and look at the data set, look at the patterns in the region, and then do some analysis. And there's a thumbnail that shows you what each map is, a paragraph that gives you a little explanation about what you're about to um, open up, and then if you'd like to, you can go ahead and open up a PDF of that document. And that's exactly what one that um, Representative Provost did. So Representative Provost was going to issue a bill um, around traffic and air quality. She said, I wonder if NACC has a map about this. And she went to the regional map gallery. Ignore the clicking of the button. She went to the regional map gallery, and she clicked up um, and looked around, and she found a map of air quality, air quality and public health. 
It's okay. I'll keep talking. <laughs> the one thing about technology you know is it will never um, cooperate. While they're thinking, I just wanted to also thank my staff, Jessica Martin and Aditi Mehta, for the work yes. that they did on this website as well. Yes, I'm sorry. There no, no, like my fault. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, Representative Prose printed out the map. There's the map she printed out. Um, and she was able to use that map to introduce um, a bill on the House floor. So this is an example of how you might be thinking about an issue, instead of immediately rushing to make your own map, look for your own data, look first at the regional map gallery. Chances are we've already done a map about it. But this focuses on regional trends. One of our other tools that might help you focus on a municipality is the community snapshots. So the community snapshots, are we made them for 101 cities and towns. And they are um, basic demographic and economic information uh, for each of our cities and towns. And you'll see here that we have a tab that says Boston Neighborhoods coming soon. This spring we'll have additional information for the Boston Neighborhoods. So you can go ahead and select a city or town. Susan's just going to go ahead and type in Somerville. Come up pretty easy. And there is this the Somerville Community Snapshot. It has a description of each city and town based on MAPC's community types. It has an overview map to give you a sense of the geography of the community. And then we have information on demographics, civic vitality and governance, economy, <coughs> education, environment and energy, housing, public health, and transportation. And for each one of those topic areas, there's many more visualizations behind it. So you can sort of pick and choose what you're interested in. So for demographics, let's just take a minute to check out those visual visualizations. So the chart that you see in front of you has is the change in racial and ethnic share from the decadal census between 2000 and 2010. And right now it's a static image that helps us with load times and so that people with slow computers can look at the information too. Um, but if you go ahead and you click on it, it launches a Wii session. Then now you can interact with the data. And so here we're looking at Somerville. And that, I don't know if you guys can read that, it's a little bigger. We're just going to Here you can see in Somerville, Somerville the change. The, Change the difference in the share of the white population, it went down by three, three and a half percent between 2000 and 2010. Whereas the Asian and Latino population in that community, the share increased. Um, and you can compare that trend to the Massachusetts and NBC regional trend, which had a similar uh, trend as well. And then you can look at that information in a different way. You can look at it as a table. So you can then look at the actual numbers, how they compare from 2000 to 2010. But let's say you want to look at all the demographic information we have. So let's go ahead and click view all. And that launches another window with all the demographic visualizations we've set made for you. So you can see the visualization on the left and the table on the right. So their citizen, I'm sorry, their citizenship status, again comparing to the Somerville to NAPC in Massachusetts. There's geographic mobility in the past year and population by age, and then projected population to 2030, and more information about race and ethnicity. Again, each of these are weave uh, interactive visuals that you can interact with, or you can choose um, to print it out. But one of the things I really like about the, um, the community snapshots and the way that we enables us to interact with data is you, you can also compare each municipality to it, its peer groups. So let's go ahead and look at, go back to the data. So you can look at you can compare a municipality and look at how it compares to other municipalities in the region. So we're going to look at transportation data, and we're going to look at this is a, a map of daily vehicle miles, and this features um, inspectional records information that's been shared with us from MassGIS. Actually, it's from the Registry of Motor Vehicles, and the analysis was done by MassGIS. You can see here that we has been activated and it's highly it's glowing around Somerville, and you can see that. Somerville, it's the sort of salmon color, and it's in the range between 25 and 50, mi 50 miles. It's uh, uh, almost 29 daily passenger vehicle miles per household, which sounds, I don't know, what do we think about that number? The best way to understand what you think about the number is to get regional or municipal context for it. So let's go down and look at Norwell, Norwell for example. 
look at Norwell. They have almost 86 uh, miles, daily passenger vehicle miles per household per day, compared to Somerville's almost 29. And that really immediately gives you a sense of the relationship of those two communities. And Somerville has a pretty low um, amount of daily vehicle miles driven. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that you can go ahead and just print out these um, snapshots as they are, or that you can interact with them. And printing them out is one of the big, um, big asks we got a lot from a lot of our community groups. They are always interested in it. What's the, I have a grant that's due tomorrow. What's a quick way I can do a quick profile of demographics in the economy? And um, this has been used a lot by municipalities and government, or uh, excuse me, municipalities and community-based organizations to submit for grant applications. In fact, um, the, pl the planner and economic development um, officer from, Bar from Framingham were applying for a federal grant for pre-disaster mitigation funds. And the first round, or the first hurdle they had to go through for funding was to create a baseline, uh, um, a baseline assessment or a trend, excuse me, baseline assessment of their municipality's trends. And they printed out the community snapshot, they submitted it exactly as it was to the feds, and the feds accepted it. So they immediately moved on to the next round of funding. Not the funding, but the application process. They did end up getting funding, which is good too. But basically, the community snapshots are really a great place to start when you're looking at a municipality for the first time and you're trying to understand it, or you're trying to communicate what's happening in your municipality to a funder or planning organization. All right. So now we've looked at how you can get information for regional trends through the regional map gallery. We looked at community snapshots and looking at community trends. But really, we also have questions about our neighborhood. And we often look for data sets that are below municipality. One of the best places to do that is in the visualization gallery. And this is a little bit more, again, we talked about the beginner, uh, intermediate, and advanced user levels. We're starting to get to a little bit more of an intermediate user level here. There's a little more complexity to using the tool at this point. Um, visualization Gallery features visualizations that have been made by anybody who's logged into the Metro Boston Data Commons. Right now, it features mainly visualizations that our staff at NAPC and the Boston Foundation Indicators Project has made. But anytime a uh, user will log on to the Metro Boston Data Commons and save their work, they can choose whether to show their map and add it to the gallery or to keep it private in their own workspace. And so um, you can search each of the visualizations by topic, and you can search it by the data source. And then you can also search um, for visualizations made by a particular author. So for example, I know Susan is a really great map maker, so I might start to follow her maps. And before I decide to make a map, I'm gonna see what Susan's made. And so let's go down and see. You can see that she made. The other way you can look at it is you can click on her name at the bottom. If Susan's profile comes up, you can see she's made 31 visualizations. You can start to look about to see what she's made. So I'm not going to go through the process of making my own map when I can just work on Susan's um, and then make a copy of my own and benefit from what she does so well. So this is one of the ideas of the data common, is that we work together to create analysis, not reinventing the wheel. But we can build off of each other's knowledge. Susan wants me to emphasize that you need to log in to save your maps. Right? Yes. Yeah. You, you could you, you customize your own. Um, so let me let me go back. Um, so one of the things you can do is you take a visualization and when you log in, you create a copy and you can customize your own and save a new copy under your name. You won't ruin. See, I think Susan's worried. I'm going to ruin her maps. You don't ruin the person's maps that you're making the copy of, but you make your own now. So one of the things um, we'd like to do is show you a little bit about the po the power of weave. <laughs> By looking at children and families below poverty, it's something that's been on our mind a lot lately with the economic times and understanding how, the, how children and families are faring in Massachusetts. And this, we're going to go through a series of data um, layers and different visualizations to sort of take apart a particular question or a particular um, idea about uh, families and children. And so, first of all, we have a map of children and families below poverty. This is um, ACS data. And let's zoom out, Susan, so we can look at Eastern Massachusetts. And what you can see here in the darker um, reds are concentrations of poverty. So that's in Lawrence and Lowell, and then uh, a little bit of Framingham there, down in Brockton. And as you see, Susan's scrolling over the different geographies. They're glowing in the map. They're also glowing in the scatter plot and in the histogram. So you're immediately having interaction between all the visualizations at once. So there's also concentrations in Boston, but it's hard to see at this scale. So let's go ahead and zoom in. 
And so we can see for the most part, um, most of Massachusetts and the area surrounding Boston are this light salmon color. For example, the census tract in Brookline has um, 2.7% or rather 33 children in families below poverty. And you can see again that the histogram is glowing. Oh, go ahead, go to the histogram. So if you go and um, float over the histogram, it also works backwards, where you can see all the census tracts that are stacked up there in that salmon color, that are in that same range with under 250 children in poverty, are glowing in pink. So you understand immediately that 1,155 census tracts in Massachusetts, which are the majority of census tracts, have let under 250 children in poverty. What's interesting now is if we look at the darkest color there, uh, a census tract just near the heart of our city, near Franklin Park, um, and you can see something that's um, pretty startling. 54% uh, or 1,032, or 1,032 children are in families below poverty. That's a very strong concentration of poverty in Boston. And as a matter of fact, you can see them in the histogram glowing over there in the bottom. That's the strongest concentration in the state. So we're already starting to understand a little bit about this data, about what's happening in this neighborhood. We already have a context for those trends. Um, and so, you know, when we're thinking about families and children that are in poverty, and we're trying to think about how to help lift them up out of poverty, one of the common things we think about is education, right? You know, if you get a, a high school degree, a college degree, you're more likely to get a better paying job. So let's, let's just go check that assumption. So on the histogram there, we have on the um, y-axis, we have the percent, the percent bachelor's degree or higher for total, or excuse me, it's just percent bachelor's? percent bachelor's degree um, for the total population that's 25 or older versus the children and, and families below poverty. And you can see in the census tracts where there's a higher amount of people with bachelor's degrees, they're, lo they're less likely to be children in poverty. So there's a clear uh, relationship um, between, between that. And here we are using R, which is an open source statis uh, statistical software um, that's making that trend line that's helping us to read that. And you can plug that in and, and access all the power that R has as well. So when you think about trying to lift families out of poverty, and we understand that education is an important component of that, of course we want to start to understand what are the educational resources that surround these families. So let's go ahead and turn on the Boston Public Schools. <laughs> So you can see she can customize the various layers in the mapping application. And so the black dots, she's turned on the Boston Public Schools. Yeah. And then let's look at how our children are doing in those schools. Let's look at the MCAS scores. In particular, we're going to look at the third grade um, reading proficiency scores from the MCAS from 2010 to 2011. Um, and it's the third grade reading scores because it's an important grade because that's when children are stopped learning to read and they're reading to learn. It's a very critical time. And here we have a very straight line because of course we're showing the same thing on the x-axis and the y-axis so we'd expect it to be a straight line. Let's go look at the school with the, high, the highest performance. We look, oh, it's, it's Deerfield School. That's not in Boston. We must have all, all of the schools in the state up. So let's do a subselect. Let's create a subselection. Now let's, can we do that again a little slower? So what Susan's doing, she's using the map to create a subselection out of the MCAS scores. So we're just going to pull up the Boston schools, and you can see they highlighted on the, um, the line up there. There we go, create some subset. Now she's edited out all this, the schools that were outside of Boston, and we're just using the Boston school data now. So now we're looking at um, all students. The highest performing school is the Mary Lyons School, where 84% of all students are proficient or higher with third grade reading MCAS. Let's look at the lowest performing school. Is the J.P. Holland School, with only 14% of students are proficient. So let's, let's look at all students compared to white students. Let's look a little more closely at how the different demographic groups are faring in these different schools, and look at the highest performing schools and the lowest performing schools. So this looks at, she just changed the x-axis to the percent of students proficient or higher for grade three reading MCAS. And you can see there that on the right-hand side, some dots have now um, clustered to the side. What this helps you do is it helps you interpret the quality of your data. We understand that there's some null values now in our data. So what you quickly can think about is that, that those, those, uh, uh, excuse me, those values have been suppressed for confidentiality reasons. There's just not enough white students um, that took the third grade test in that school that year. So they suppressed the values to protect confidentiality. 
So let's go look at the highest performing school. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So the K through 8 school, um, it has 92% of whites are proficient versus 45% of all students. Let's look at the lowest performing school, which is the Samuel Adams School, where 18% of white students are proficient versus 16% of all students. So let's look at Latino students and see how they fare. So again, there's all these variables that are in. We can put them up and look at them in comparison. <laughs> again, you'll notice the null values off to the right, so we have a sense of the quality of our data. The highest performing school for Latinos is uh, the Elias Mendel at 82% for Latinos, and the Farragut School at 6% um, for Latinos versus 21% of all students that are proficient. And um, finally, let's look at black and African American students. So the highest performing school for black and African American students um, for the third grade reading scores is 82% uh, um, for the Edward Burke Charter School and 83% of all students. That's pretty high. Let's go ahead and you know, th one of the things that I think is important here is we can start to look at what are the programs and best practices that might be leading to the high test, test scores in the school. So let's right click and let's look for it on Google. So one of the things that this, this Weave tool does is it opens information, it opens up information. And so it allows you to take that variable that you were just probing and Google it for it. So we can go ahead and look at the Edward um, Brook Charter School. And if we had more time, we could go through and review what are some of the programs they have. Do they have reading specialists? Do they have after school tutors? What are some of the programs that are helping them get to these high test scores? And we can start to think about how to propagate out some of those programs in some of the underperforming schools where those, fa where those families really need the help. The education of our children is not solely, um, it's not the sole responsibility of the school system though. We often look to enrichment programs outside of school to help round out the education they receive in the classroom such as uh, boys and girls after schools, uh, school programs or um, different tutoring programs. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at what are the other nonprofit educational institutions that surround those, those families that are in that census tract. And so we're going to hit on um, the Boston Nonprofit Educational Assets. And these are forms that we took from the um, tax form, or these, this is information that we got from tax forms that nonprofits fill out, the 990 forms. As, and when they classify themselves as an educational institution. You can see here the clustering, or the lack of clustering. Um, so up in the Back Bay area where a lot of the universities are, it's no surprise that there's a lot of clustering of educational uh, assets and institutions. But down in that census tract where our families need help, there's not a lot of assets outside of, um, or in their neighborhood. And so they need to often look to outside their neighborhood to build enrichment and um, more opportunity for their families. And so immediately the question is, how are they going to get to those additional facilities and educational institutions? Well, we know um, that there are buses there and there are subways. So let's take a look at the subways. So it's sort of hard to see those, Susan. Can you make those just a little bit bigger? So you can do some cosmetic changes pretty easily in Weave if you want to change the way something looks. There, that stands out a lot more. And what you can see is, what a lot of us know, and some of us live every day in our lives, um, that the subway does not go through that neighborhood which is pretty stark when you look at it in this map. Um, and so we also know that a lot of the community members um, or families in, that, um, in those neighborhoods don't often have a car. And the census data tells us that they have um, less than one car per household. And so they must rely on buses. And buses often in that neighborhood take a lot, long time to reach other parts of the city. So we're adding yet another hurdle to those families to accessing more opportunities and enrichment for their families. And then finally, we have heard a little bit of something about the Fairmont line, right? There's a little bit of a glimmer of hope. There is a commuter rail line that goes through that neighborhood that doesn't stop. And there's planning and organizing underway to create stops in those neighborhoods. So you start to understand how you can, um, uh, if you look at different data layers together and think about a particular issue in a neighborhood, you can start to uh, pull apart a problem and think about it from different perspectives. And one of the interesting things is here is if you're a transportation planner, you might suddenly understand how you could reach out to an educational um, constituency group to, about the Fairmount line to help you organize for it. Or if you're an educational um, advocate, you might start to understand how important the Fairmount line is to um, the families in this area who need help. So that's just a one example, one data story of how you can piece together different data sets to look at a particular issue and use Weave to do analysis. Just a few more things before I pass it off. So
So one of the things we want to do is we want to save this hard work that Susan just did. So Susan's going to go ahead and show you. You could save it. You could duplicate it. Um, you could also embed it in our website. Let's say we really like it. We could bring it to our own website and embed it. Did you say that? Yeah, we could save it. Okay. And I will highlight that the maps that are in the, vi the visualization gallery um, come from the do-it-yourself area. Can you go over to the do-it-yourself? Oh, you're just showing that. Um, so there's a do-it-yourself area, and it comes with a warning. It's pretty much a blank slate. That's where all the good maps that Susan's created have come from. And with a little bit of training, this is the area we can create practical maps as well. Um, and then finally, I think I just want to talk about, you can always get in touch with us if you'd like to use our tool, if you want to give us feedback or give us more ideas for functionality. Um, you can go to the feedback and support button on the side and um, give us your complaints, your kudos, your questions. One of the things you might want to do is you might want to actually, um, do you want to click on one? Yeah, someone was reporting they had troubles with the webcast this morning, it's great. Um, you might want to check if someone's already reported your problem and then go vote for the, the problem. Because what that does is it's going to help us prioritize the, the fixes we're going to do. It also might help us prioritize um, adding different functionality. We have trainings at once a month at the, Metro, at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council's office if you'd like to bring your colleagues or come get a better train or an additional training yourself. There's also two trainings this afternoon and the workshops we're about to break into and I believe there are still spots in the second workshop if you'd like to get um, hands-on training on how to use this tool. Um, but we look forward to receiving questions from you and seeing how you use the tool and watching your maps pop up in the visualization gallery. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, this is very, very impressive. Um, it's a dream I've had to be able to put data and uh, the capabilities of exploring data in the hands of everyone. And um, I can see that uh, this is the beginning of it, and it's really a little bit um, overwhelming to watch this. Uh, when it started three years ago, it was real tiny, and we had visions and so on, and I think they've evolved dramatically. So I want to go through four things, and I think then we have uh, Mary Beth who's going to show a uh, Lowell um, foreclosure demo. There are two myths that are out there. The first one is really related to us, and that is that it's not possible for students to develop commercial-grade software. This is an example that counters that, and my students have done that in the past many, many times. Students actually have an advantage over commercial organizations in that they, are often, they often know the state of the art. They've learned a wide variety of things. And of course, as is well known because there are a lot of students here, they work 80-hour weeks, 100-hour weeks. They're committed. They just never stop. You can ask a student, can you do something? And the student will typically, especially my students, will say, of course. Okay. And it's wonderful to be in that environment. And it, you could see the kinds of things that can evolve when students do that. And I will introduce them in a minute. The second one, which is a much more serious one, which actually came up as a grand challenge in visualization over the last five years, um, is that the public is dumb. And in fact, that's driven a lot of presentations a lot of arguments for not highlighting information or providing tools to the public. But the fact is, you're part of the public. I'm sure you're not dumb. And if you watch around how many people like me at my age are texting and using all the modern tools, clearly I've had to adapt. I have kids. I have no choice. <laughs> They're not going to talk to me on the phone. They will text. And so the fact is, that assumption is a very serious one that we have to break. And WEAVE, which stands for Web-Based Analysis and Visualization Environment, and all the members of the consortium, and Charlotte Kahn, and Holly, and Jim Lucht, who's here from the Providence Plan, and Jim Farnham from Data Haven, and the students, and many of you actually believe that we can 
get data to the public and start changing the way decisions are made. Because the public also involves decision makers. And a decision maker can tear apart the data to identify better things, but a decision maker is a human being. Limited views, often, often with biases. The public also has their biases, and it's where the two meet and exchange visualizations, ideas, discussions that consensus is going to be reached. And so I think this is a major, major step for the evolution of not just the US and communities, but the world in terms of realizing that it's not just open data, but it's also the beginning of open tools that people can start using, that anyone can start using. By having something like this, for example, we can potentially harness a 12-year-old that's looking at the data and has a great idea, saves it, and other people can start looking at it. That's tremendous people harnessing. And I think that's extremely valuable. So I mentioned Charlotte Kahn. I want to thank her personally because I'm, a, I, I'm not a geek, but I sure like working on very, very hard problems, technology, medicine, homeland security, those things. That's where money is. Okay? And all of a sudden, Charlotte says, you know, there are other larger problems. And she really educated me in terms of some of the key issues and led me to pick up a new vision, which is provide data access and data tools to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And so we've adopted that within the consortium. Holly's adopted it within the MAPC and the website that you can look at. And in fact, I think it's a really interesting idea to, to think about. So all these individuals here committed to this vision. Now, developing software, as you know, you sort of identify requirements, you go ahead and code, and you're done. Well, except when you have 10 different organizations. When you have 10 organizations, each of which wants something different, then you start running into problems. Somebody will say, well, I want two color maps here. Susan will call us and say, I need to have this by tomorrow. And some organizations have small data sets. Grand Rapids is pushing us very, very far with large data sets that they want to put on a page. Christian comes up and says, I need 15 images on one web page, and we have to come up with a solution. And the solutions are compromises. But the fact that we had so many organizations that had different requirements led to the flexibility that you're looking at in Weave. Without them, Weave's richness wouldn't be there, and it's continuing to evolve. The university, by the way, agreed to release Weave as an open source package. The reason that's important is there's lots of technology that's embedded within Weave that had patents. And so the university, by saying this is really an important activity, agreed. And we're going to talk this afternoon about how do you develop open source, how do you fund those activities, uh, what are the ramifications. So you can attend that if you like. Um, so there are some key capabilities here that you're seeing, and Mary Beth is going to come up and show this. But I want to add three capabilities that are coming around the corner, probably that will be available over the summer. The first one is collaboration. We've built in individuals, Charlotte had mentioned this, uh, that can collaborate non-co-located at a distance. And we can work with hundreds of individuals collaborating. The key issue right now that we're trying to wrap up is how the interface is going to look like because you can imagine if 100 people all of a sudden grab the mouse, this would sort of create chaos on there. So we're working on that, re resolving that, and I think by the end of the summer we'll have that. People can collaborate now or shortly with the system, but it's still rough. And I should mention that this is a system in development. You're looking at one of the early releases. Um, I think that, in other words, there'll be bugs, and Christian pointed one out up there, and there'll be bugs that you'll run into, and it's important for us to know, and we fix them as they come in. The second one is that the system keeps track, if you let it, of everything you do, the process or the session history, so to speak. The ramifications of that are immense. We've been doing that for many, many years, but it means you can now look at how do people analyze data? How did they discover data? You can imagine this running in a class 
whether it's a STEM class or non-STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics or not, give a problem to the students, look at how they solve the problem, analyze the data, and then start seeing, ah, there are patterns. This is much, much stronger than external surveys because you're actually letting people work themselves and for looking at ways that things can be done. And the third one is we've incorporated and are building out text analysis. So for example, you can tie newspaper data, look at sentiment analysis, and start looking at how does that tie in with the data. In Weave, as a final statement, you can pull in any data that you want and integrate the data as long as there are some common fields or dimensions or attributes. That means you can take newspaper data that might have financial information, you could take financial information, you could take a map, and you could start integrating the three to start searching these multiple databases. In a way, that's the beginning of overcoming data silos where everyone develops their own da databases. Weave, in some fashion, begins to break that down because you can pull the data together from different sources. Okay, Mary Beth. So I, I want to introduce the students. So Mary Beth was one of the first architects of Weave. She's getting her doctorate um, if she passes her defense over the next month, not to put any pressure on her. Andy DeFeely is um, the current architect, okay, and there are a bunch of students sitting in the audience. Can you stand up? I think Curran Kelleher, a um, bunch of others, okay. And then last, we have, we have two staff members that have been working on this for a long time, and that's Helen Lyons and uh, Catherine Dennison. Can you stand up, Helen? <laughs> okay. And it's really important to realize that um, we're a university. So whenever you think of someone working within the university setting, it's very, very different than, an or than a commercial organization. These, everyone here is completely dedicated to making this successful. Okay, Mary Beth. Hi, so I'm going to show you a demonstration of Weave using, showing um, foreclosures in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, so we started with this data, this long list of addresses of foreclosures during um, the housing crisis in Lowell, and we wanted to um, pull that onto the map. So we started with this list of these addresses, and we're able to pull them and actually show each foreclosure on the map. And um, we can zoom in and actually see, as we zoom into different levels, you can see that the, the blocks are coming up, so you can see exactly the addresses of the different foreclosures, and then we can zoom back out again to different levels, so we can sort of understand the different neighborhoods and where these foreclosures are happening. I'm gonna try and zoom out a little bit here. So we can zoom out to different levels and zoom in as we're exploring the data. Um, and I have a scatter plot here. Uh, we're looking at Hispanic or Latino. So these are um, census tracts. Each dot in the scatter plot is a census tract. And we can explore the ethnicity of the different uh, census tracts and see where the foreclosures are. So if you hover over it, you can see that it highlights the census tract. And you can see how many foreclosures were in each of the census tracts. And then on the bottom, we have a bar chart showing how many foreclosures are in that census tract. So we can explore, for example, this neighborhood that has a high percentage of Hispanic or Latino families. And we can explore, um, we see that, that on the bar chart down here where that highlights, that census track on the bottom, can you see that? It has a small number of foreclosures. So we can, um, then we can change the scatter plot or we can move over years. Here we have a time slider. So we can see um, how the foreclosures um, affected the different neighborhoods over the different years as the housing crisis um, occurred. So I just clicked on the scatter plot on the label, and so it gave me a list of all these different attributes that we can look at. We can change the scatter plot. Um, so if I look, if I want to look at um, Asian neighborhoods, I'll select Asian, and then that changes the scatter plot, and I'll save that. And so now um, you can see over here, this is a neighborhood, this is a census tract that has a high percentage of, of Asian families. And so we can see that that had a higher percentage, a higher number of foreclosures than the other community that we looked at that had a high percentage of Hispanic families. 
Um, so if we look at the, bottom, uh, the bar chart on the bottom, you can see um, that it had a higher, it's got a higher level of foreclosures in that neighborhood. And when we highlight it, we can see the neighborhood and we can see all the foreclosures in that neighborhood. Um, it could be that there's a higher percentage of homeowners in that census tract, and maybe that's why we're seeing more foreclosures in this neighborhood. Um, but, the, but what Weave does is it lets you pull all this data in and explore it and dig deeper and look at the different things that you want to, want to look at. So if we wanted to look at the percentage of home ownership in the different census tracts, we could put that up onto the scatter plot and explore whether maybe that is the reason why that, that this neighborhood with a high percentage of Asians is potentially having a, 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 a larger problem with the, with the foreclosures during that time period. Um, we have a, a time slider, so you can move over the di different years, and you can see that the colors of the census tracts are changing as we move over the years. And the colors represent um, how many foreclosures are in each of those census tracts. So the darker colors are um, 35 to 49, and then down here in the lighter colors, it's zero to less than five. So those are the census tracts that have a small number of foreclosures. Um, but Weave is very customizable from the, the, the user, on the user side. You can customize it as a, a system administrator, but also as a user for Weave so that you can change the different indicators that you're looking at and you can really probe into the data to try to understand it because different questions will come up as you're exploring. You know, why is it that there's a large number of foreclosures in that particular neighborhood? And, and so instead of having a static image of that map, you can look in and try, and try and understand more, and you can dig deeper as more questions occur, and they will with visualization. It brings up more and more questions. The more you learn, the more you're gonna to start to question. So we give you the ability to dig into that data to really understand it better and to interact with it. And humans, humans learn by interacting with their environment. So by interacting with this data and digging deeper as you discover new things, um, we provides the potential to, for a deeper understanding of what this data is telling us and what this data has to share with us. Um, so you can change and you can even add different uh, visualizations. If you want to add scatter plots, bar charts, pie charts, line charts, um, different kinds of tools to, to view the data in different ways with different visualizations. Um, but that can be disabled when you're ready uh, to do your presentation and you're ready to put it on your website. You have your map arranged exactly the way you want it and you want to put it up on your website. Um, that can be disabled so that um, the user doesn't can have as much flexibility as you want them to have on your website. You can, you know, for advanced users, let them add their own tools, let them have the full flexibility, um, but you can disable that as well if you want to keep it simple and maybe just show a very simple bar chart um, so that for, for maybe more novice users. Um, so that's it. That just shows you an example of how Weave can be used to take this list of foreclosures, just this, these addresses, and really find meaning and, and, and um, allow users to interact and to really understand the data using different visualizations, maps, bar charts, scatter plots. And that's all I have. So, and I've asked Andy to show you some of the very advanced capabilities. It'll just take two minutes architecturally what can be done to give you a sense of the flexibility that Mary Beth was discussing. Hello, I'm Andrew Dufoli. I'm the uh, lead engineer of Weave. I'm just going to load a new page here. While Andy's doing that, um, I'm on a listserv that everybody's on, and often I see, you know, 11:30, 1:30, 6:30 in the morning. People are communicating with Andy and saying, "This doesn't work," or "What about this? What about that?" And he is responding. <laughs> So here we're seeing. <laughs> so here we're seeing uh, obesity data from the CDC. It's time series data from 1995 to 2010. You can see it's colored by percent obese in 1995, and in the histogram it's showing the distribution of the percent obese in in each state. And at the bottom, there's a bar chart, one bar per state, and it has the label for percent obese. And now at the top, there's a time slider. When I slide the time slider, it's, it's going to change each of these visualizations. They're all linked. So I can step through the years. I'm, I'm pressing the keyboard now. So you can see at the bottom of the histogram, all the bars are moving to the right. It's a normal distribution, and all the states together are becoming a higher percentage of obese. 
So this is an epidemic in the United States. So you can use Weave to build these kind of uh, um, stories in visualization to really prove a point. And then as I'm um, interacting with this, making selections, I can even move the windows around. What it's doing is it's recording the history, session history. So there's this beta functionality. At the top you see there's a slider. And what I can do now is I can step back through the history, undo what I just did. <laughs> so this shows you the power of the system. This, this is not... Um, this feature is not completed yet. We're not letting um, end users use it um, yet. But we're, what we're going to be able to do in the future is save this session history into a file, and you'd be able to replay it from anywhere in the world so you can make these kinds of animations and prove your point. And you notice that every, every little thing that I do is being recorded. We also have the functionality functionality built into Weave for collaboration, remote um, synchronous collaboration. So two people on other sides of the world can collaborate at the same time on the same visualization. They can, um, we don't have the functionality yet, we're working on it right now to add uh, voice and video chat. Um, so that's coming in the near future. Um, and also what, el what else is coming is a plugin architecture where we can load any kind of new visualization that other developers around the world create. Uh, for example, we have bar chart, scatter plot. Um, what if somebody creates a new type of visualization, like a heat map? So they could build it using the Weave um, libraries. And then without recompiling Weave, we can load in their new tool. So this is a framework for um, data collaborators, for collaborating programmers, all kinds of things. Um, we're all really excited about it. Hi folks, uh, I'm Jim Luke, I'm Information Director at Crovin's Plan, and uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit about how we are implementing Weave um, in our Data Hub project. I can figure out how to uh, move the screen. Okay. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate a lot of the functionality of Weave because you've already seen a lot of the coolest uh, functionality as well as stuff that's coming out. And that's actually being facilitated by the fact that our instance of Weave is being slow right now. It's trying to embarrass me. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, the, this project and how we're in using Weave and leveraging um, some of the things that kind of only Weave does to uh, enable visualizations. So a, a little bit of history on the Data Hub. We started this project a few years ago. It was funded by Safe and Drug Free Schools money. Um, and the focus was on um, giving people, uh, integrating, building a data, integrated data system to target interventions for uh, uh, drug abuse and, and violence. So we uh, ended up, um, building our own linkage engine to link individual person level data across multiple state agencies and for the entire state of Rhode Island. Um, we have uh, uh, four agencies involved right now, Department of Education, Department of Health, uh, Children, Youth and Families, and now uh, higher ed. So we have all of the data for the three state uh, universities. Um, so we uh, wanted to build a platform that catered to many different user levels. Um, so we came up with this approach, uh, the Data Hub, which allows users to access data basically three ways. Um, so it's probably the, one of the simplest ways, if you're just looking for a particular um, fact, are the reports. So you can see a lot of the reports that are up here have to do with substance abuse and violence at this point. Um, if you're interested in uh, kind of doing it yourself and creating stuff from scratch, which a couple of the previous presenters showed, you can you know, pick any visualization you want, go into your catalog of data and pull the data in. That's kind of under the Weave tab. Um, and that would be, you know, for us, for the Data Hub users, that would be more of an advanced user. 
And for that advanced user, probably the biggest challenge is allowing, you know, facilitating them to find the data that they need. Because we're only really, uh, you know, this project is still in beta and we have over 700 iterations of the different indicators that we have. So to allow users to find stuff really easily, we have uh, a data catalog where you can type in search terms. So I just typed in birth and say go. And uh, it gives you a list of all the different iterations of indicators that we have with that keyword. You can narrow it down by geographies and data source. Here we see where there are multiple symbols. It means that data is actually a product of linking individual records across multiple data sets, multiple state agencies that were never meant to talk to each other. So we do that through first name, last name, date of birth combinations. And we have a whole uh, you know, bit of software that does that. And so once you choose your indicators, you can put them into what we call an iList. If you log in, you have an account. And then that will be the first tier of indicators that are available to you in Weave. So you don't have to do a lot of navigation through a lot of different hierarchies. Those indicators will be right there under the name that you call them. But one of the main things that we're doing, and we're getting a lot of mileage out of it, is uh, the concept of data stories. And for us, it's a, uh, a basically an interactive, almost like a PowerPoint presentation on the web. Here's an example of uh, one that we did um, before we even had uh, children, youth, and family data in, uh, and we were used uh, uh, Department of Education data with the kids that we knew were at DCYF schools, and we built a story around um, how to identify the characteristics of kids who are at risk for involvement within the juvenile justice system. So the, the format that this takes is that there's an essential question, and that follows you through the entire data story, and there's introductory material, and then you go through, and you know we're basing this on research, and we kind of you know educate people on the direction that we're going, and we are using all these different indicators, and then we allow people to go in and uh, explore the different indicators. So, for instance, in this example, which is taking a little bit to come up, um, we're comparing kids in DC that are actually in kind of DCYF custody because they're attending those particular schools with kids who are attending the non-DCYF schools. And what we found out for the list of indicators that we were interested in, which was on the previous slide, um, the uh, kids who were in DCYF schools had on average three of those indicators where all the other kids had you know, less than half that amount. If you're interested in the individual indicators, you can go in, again, it has, this is actually a previous version of Weave. We're a couple weeks away from getting the latest and greatest integrated in our site, so that this is gonna look a little bit different. Um, but you can go in and you can choose any of these indicators on the fly. And the text, the explanatory text down below makes some of the suggestions. It depends on the slide you're at. They say, it'll say, you know, click the axis and, and change it to this indicator um, and, and explore that. Um, so this, uh, it was a big deal for us. Um, there are a lot of integrated data systems being built throughout the country. Uh, not very many of them actually have a public visualization component. And that was a huge piece for us. Uh, initially, we were going to do a couple different tiers of permissions, and uh, but we decided to make you know all of the the content public. So um, we are in the process of developing uh, data stories with different constituencies, and then whenever we do a project for folks, all that data goes into the data hub, and then it's completely public for people to explore and, and publish. Um, we're also currently using outside the data hub. I'm just using standalone Weave visualizations to, for the first time, analyze uh, data, uh, uniform chart of account data on school financing across all the different school districts in Rhode Island. So I'm um, getting a lot of hands on with that. Um, but what I guess the final thing I'd like to say is that this data story approach that we're taking is both a product at the end and a process where we sit down with the people and uh, leverage you know, all the constituencies, whether they be on the advocate side or the state agency side, and sit down and create the data story together, which is an awful lot of work, but it's very rewarding because at the, the, during the entire time, the indicators are vetted, they decide what's important, what to include, how to interpret it, um, and then in the end, they have a product that you know, people can agree on, and, and the process has been there, so everyone's on board. Um, so over the next year, we're gonna be creating a, a bunch more of these, and, uh, and you know, Doing a, doing a lot of work, but that's all I have. Thanks.
We've been uh, we've uh, OIC Open Indicators Consortium partner from the beginning, and uh, long before that, as Charlotte pointed out, uh, we were I was bugging her. We were collaborating to see what why don't we just all get together and do it once and do it right and do it ourselves because we'd all had such varied experiences with different vendors and different platforms and we knew what we wanted. So here we are. We're, I'd say we're sort of on the road, uh, you know, a, a third of the way down the road to where we want to be, but that third is incredibly far ahead of where we started out. So this, um, the Data Collaborative was a, a, a group of people, much like some of yourselves, I'm sure, that just were very frustrated with the, the availability of data in Connecticut, the quality of it, the ease of getting it, and some of us uh, did a lot of work in community assessment, community planning, and we had to go ferret it out from all the different agencies and get it in you know, handwritten form, spreadsheets, uh, disks, and uh, PDF files. And so we said, well, look, there should be a place where we can have uh, good data uh, addressing the issues we want to address in one place in a consistent format. And, so we, and then we added that idea. We got together a public-private partnership, recruited uh, funding, got funders involved, and we created this uh, ctdata.org website, which is just still in soft launch. So we haven't really uh, been publicizing it, uh, so you're one of the first groups we've ever shown it to, but it, we've been working on it for about a year and a half. We've had earlier versions and tested it with a lot of different user groups over the, over the time period. And I think the concept here is that we're, it's a, a utility across many issue areas and geographies in Connecticut, and so we've recruited partners to work with us to create what we call customized portals. So if you, here on the portals tab, we have the early childhood constituencies working with 55 communities that are doing early childhood plans through a foundation-sponsored program called Discovery. Coastal Fairfield County is a geographic portal. We're, we're, we're working with a coalition around Bridgeport, Connecticut to put, uh, serve the coalitions and people working in that area. The State Epidemiology and Outcomes Work Group uh, provides data for um, <clears throat> a, the Regional Action Council's fighting substance abuse across the state. And that's uh, uh, 10 state agencies at the table providing data. And this, uh, they uh, had, had been frustrated about how hard it was to give it out and train people to use it and give it in consistent format. So those, those are the, um, the groups we're dealing with. I'll go to the early childhood just portal just to show the features uh, that we've been developing. We have uh, all our data. And uh, with uh, hats off to Rhode Island, we sort of borrowed their idea of a data catalog where you can see it by, by years or by geography, where you can do a filtering by different categories in the metadata, by who provided the data, the years. So all the data in the portal is in one place. And then for each sub, each customized portal, we filter it to their specific interests. So we, we don't, if, if the early childhood folks don't really care about uh, equalized net grand list per capita, we don't, they can block it out from their portal. You can still get it from the main portal if you want to. You can, um, so then the, um, the other two major functions, we have a knowledge center where we're documenting all our work, documenting all the metadata. Uh, and then an, an example is in the data catalog, when you uh, click on this little question mark button, I, I did it already, you get all the metadata for that data point. So you can see the frequency and limitations and calculation notes, numerator, denominator. And that's, we're gonna create, this is gonna be, it's a wiki format, so we're gonna get our community of registered users will be able to add their experience with a particular indicator. If, it, if there's one indicator that's really hot in the early childhood community, they can document it up and say who's using it for what purposes, what were the meanings they brought out of it in their community. Um, and they can, and then in, under the uh, Weave It tab, which is, um, is uh, where we visualize the data, we have, we worked with them to say, well, how would you want to see this data? So we, we, we prescribed four different formats and we can do this and customize this. So it's a customized sort of easy, access set of visualizations that people said, I really want to see it in a, in a, in this case, it's in a, in a, all the towns in the state in one bar chart, uh, where you have a bar chart, you can roll over the towns and then you can find your town. You can look at groupings of towns. Um, 
it's, and then you can choose, you can change your indicator once you're in there to any, uh, either just the headlines or the full list of all the disaggregations of every indicator that's in our system. So that's um, in, this, in, this, in this portal, or you can filter it by domain. So we're still working on this, and I think uh, you could filter it you know, by years or what, however you want to do it. And this also has the time slider feature, so you can look at different years of data and um, see how it's changing over time. And you can also like create subsets, so you can go in and say, Listen, I just want to zoom in on that subgroup of the data, however you want to do it. Um, and the, the, they said, we want to be able to compare our towns to other towns. So we've developed a, a compare town bar chart where for a particular indicator that you choose, and you can add towns. So this is um, uh, 10 years worth of data on the uh, prenatal care non-adequate for mothers, but from the birth records uh, got from the state. And then you just, you can um, compare your town to, uh, so this is Bridgeport compared to the state of Connecticut. So you just uh, go here and you can say, well, I, what's Hartford up to? So we have Hartford, you can add them, and then you can go and add uh, <coughs> New Haven. So you have your three biggest urban areas, and um, you can add the state back in. So you can see over time, um, how it's, uh, how it's uh, and then as you roll over, you see the actual values, individual values. You can also sort them down here. You have the numerator, the denominator, and the, all that. So this is, and then you can just right click and export um, an image of the whole thing or, and put it into your PowerPoint or your report or, or export the, just the bar chart. Uh, and you can change the title on it and uh, do other manipulations of it. We're still working, Based on user user feedback, we uh, some things we developed. Uh, the whole selection process is a JavaScript uh, application programming interface API. It's outside Weave, and then the Weave instance is the middle part. Um, we also have a gallery feature. I'm not sure who came up with the word gallery first, but we 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 uh, have different approaches to it. Where we've you can uh, produce your gallery, then you can click on it and just bring it up and show share it. And we're going to have, uh, when you log in, you, you have this group feature. So you can set up a group of, the, of 10 registered people that only can see that set that you dedicate, uh, you limit views of your visualizations. You, you can either share it with the whole public, your group, a group, or just keep it private to yourself based on the settings. And this is where you can delete your or edit your uh, gallery entries. Um, and I just wanted to <coughs> show um, the advanced weave is, we call it advanced weave. We're, we're hoping to train lots of people in how to use weave. So advanced weave, you just comes up with a uh, open, this is where you can create your gallery entries. Um, and you, the whole thing, is, as uh, people said, is based on what's called a session state. So I'm just gonna give you a little, this is something I did while I was uh, listening this morning to, uh, I created this in a few minutes and I just wanna show you how that brings up your um, session state, and we did it so you can make you can make it bigger. So, it, so this is uh, from the Demas Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services alcohol-related motor vehicle accidents, the rate uh, at a town level over the years, um, and so you can change. Uh, you can look at the the rates, and this is just to illustrate uh, the beginnings and sort of these sort of building blocks. This whole you can there's a whole these are all the tools you can work with as you saw, and then you as you scroll over. It, you can create a little dashboard. So you can see, you know, they're in the red because they're, you know, and actually this is uh, based on town. It should be based on the actual uh, rate. That's a glitch in the way I did it this morning. <laughs> but you can easily adjust everything as uh, Holly was showing. So as you scroll over it, if you're one of the high ones, it's there, and one of the low ones, it's in the green. And then this is a, a histogram to show the frequency, so you can see over time, as you saw in the uh, obesity demonstration. And you can, you can say, well, I just really want to look at where are the towns uh, that you can, you, and you can create a subset of just those towns. And if you, you can turn on the state geography, so you get the state boundary outline as well. Or you can go back to show all records. Um, and I think we're, we're, uh, we're really, reaching out, we've got 200 registered users from our test period, and we're reaching out to the first sort of the data users in these different uh, constituency groups that have supported our work, and then we're gonna reach out beyond them uh, very shortly. And that's basically what I want to show.
have any questions? I think it works on all of them, but our favorite right now is Mozilla. Is that correct? No? Yes? Chrome? I think it works on all of them. Yep. It works on all of them. Yeah, stay away from Explorer 7. <laughs> <laughs> and never 6. I think Internet or uh, Microsoft can sense that it's open source, so it's giving us a little bit of trouble. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, here in the front. The microphone. Sorry. Hi, I'm Sonia Durai from the city of Somerville, and I was just wondering about um, the data that's available. Are some of my um, colleagues' data available, such as the self-sufficiency standard or some of the agency data? Is that stuff that we can access or we import or submit for consideration? Yes, all the above. Um, we have, um, I don't know how many data sets in there right now, but we have many more still back at the office ready to load. Um, so those are all the data sets you talked about, our data sets that we've been working with. Um, if you'd like to recommend a data set for us to upload, or if you have a data set you'd like to upload yourself, you can do both. I'm sorry, Susan? You can load your own, yes. You can yeah, you can, you can take an Excel spreadsheet, for example, and just <laughs> upload it on top of this data if you don't want the data even downloaded to a server or made available to anyone else. In the front here in the corner? It hasn't happened yet, but um, we're building a particular tool that will allow individuals to search da for databases anywhere. And from the perspective of Weave, it doesn't matter whether the data comes from a corporation or anywhere else. But I think the question had the importance of um, as we're consumers of data, understanding some best practices about using data, which is looking at the data source, looking at the metadata, metadata which is the information about the data itself, and thinking critically about where the data is coming from. I think it's an important skill for us all to have, whether you're using Weave or just consuming a news, newspaper story. But I think that's a really great question. And Maybe, um, I think the best outcome is that we could start seeing different data sources and how you can interpret the same variable with the different data sources. So, okay. One last question? Yes. So this is all very exciting. And um, one of my concerns based on the experience of something not nearly sophisticated this that was done at UCLA many, many years ago on the Internet Indicator, which was a fabulous interactive uh, uh, map GIS based tool. Uh, and it suddenly went away one day, which very unceremoniously. And so one of the questions that I have, I think it's a primary question is how are you going to ensure the sustainability and availability of this tool and the data uh, so that we all still have access to this? Could I just I believe that that um, system was a proprietary system and that it got sort of <coughs> caught up in some kind of intellectual property mess. And that is exactly why this, it's so wonderful and so important that this is open source. And that, and I want to just credit Christian Spanring and Holly for pushing that so hard with all of us and educating all of us. Eventually, all, you know, the legal department at, at uh, the University of Massachusetts Lowell about the importance of this so that Lowell made patented innovations available freely to all of us. So that the whole goal of this and the way that this works is that it's, it's an open source platform. People can innovate on it, but their innovations would be moderated by George and his team in order for all of us to get them so that they'd sort of um, kick the tires in terms of uh, quality and security issues. And then um, 
it, they can be, things can be made freely available to all of us. So the idea is for this to keep evolving and getting better and better and better as you all be, and others begin to engage with it. And hopefully people also in the open source uh, development community. There's also the Open Indicators Consortium that has uh, been formed to not just fund the development activity, but to build learning communities. And in fact, many questions that individuals have about uh, browser issues or performance and so, and so on are often answered by other consortium members that have the experience. And they share tools and ideas and issues. So this is a way of maintaining sustainability over time by having the community effectively participate. In, in addition, I think one of the importance of open source in the session after um, the awards, which are next, um, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about this, is um, you know, if for some reason something happens to UMass Lowell and they're interested in participating in this project, the code is up in a code repository. And so another community partner, another university partner, I hope that will never happen, um, would come and help develop it. Um, so the code is out there, it's all of ours, including the, all, everything the data common, right, is on, is on GitHub, also the code repository. So if, if for some reason NAPC's priorities change, our code is out there, someone else can take it up. Right, so let me just add one thing. Even though the code is available, <laughs> I wanna emphasize that the versions that are out there are not easy to install on a server, still require an IT person, still require some hand-holding support. We intend to solve and make it much, much easier for that to be done over the next year. But if you venture out and decide you're gonna download it yourself and install it, uh, be prepared to possibly run into some issues. Let me just say on George's and his team's behalf, um, you know, the more, what we've done is we've sort of raised local money, and I did want to credit the Bar Association of Bar Foundation, Bar pardon me, <laughs> for uh, er, their early support of this here locally. Um, but in every municipal, every team raised their own money locally. The more we could raise together, maybe somebody sitting on a lot of money, that would be great <laughs> for this. The, the faster all of this innovation can happen, and the, the more students can participate. So. Um, I just mentioned that it is, the speed of development is in part a function of, of support. Okay, great, let's have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you. Thank you.